Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So it's my honor to introduce <laughs> Yael Raf Peskin, uh, who interweaves her Jewish observance with Zen mindfulness practice and nature-based teachings of Waldorf education. In Kulanu, all of us, Yael created a nature-based program for infants and pre infants through preschoolers sharing Jewish tradition in a Waldorf inspired setting. And um, Kulanu is just inspirational to uh, witness. Uh, yeah, El was ordained as a senior student by Vietnamese Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh in 1993 and has facilitated meditation groups, mindfulness retreats, and Jewish festival celebrations for over 40 years. In 2017, Yael was San Francisco Bay Area's recipient of the Grinspoon Award for Excellence in Jewish Education. She is the mother of three adult children and grandmother to one of the sweetest people she has ever That's met. That's true. That's true. <laughs> and we are so delighted. Yael is, is um, fresh back from the Polish border with Ukraine. And um, she has a wonderful slideshow of, of images um, from your trip and is going to share with us um, some of uh, her experience. And I would just say for myself, knowing how Yael is with children um, a, really a master. And um, when I, uh, as all of us were, I'm sure, Experience, experiencing the heartbreak of seeing the Ukrainian refugees at the border and the mothers and children. And I heard Yael was going to Poland um, to assist at the Ukrainian border. And it just um, moved my heart so deeply that you would be there to be with those children. And yeah, thank you. Thank you for your service. It's my honor. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to start by asking you what um, what called you um, what called you to go to Poland. Well, I think um, you know the short answer is I think pretty much everybody when you hear the story of what's going on there, it's it's heartbreaking, it's devastating, and it happened that I had the time and the resources to go. But uh, I actually was in Costa Rica at the time. I had gone to Costa Rica last summer to do a, a three-week wellness retreat. And it was over on Erev Rosh Hashanah and the beginning of the Shemitah year. And I decided to just uh, take the Shemitah year to continue to nourish my body. Uh, and... Uh, you know, I think the pandemic hit all of us so hard, especially on the heels of four years of just uh, unspeakable heartache. And uh, I just felt like my whole body needed to be rejuvenated. And being in Costa Rica, I found my way to a small village on the Caribbean border and uh, working with children and families. I was really very warmly welcomed into that community. And uh, it felt like home as soon as I got there, actually. And um, I spent the next eight months pretty much there. I traveled mm -hmm. some around Costa Rica, but there I was um, harvesting cacao, making chocolate, coconut oil, pura vida. It was just really the most beautiful, peaceful, nourishing deeply for my physical body and soul. And uh, I began reading about what was happening in the Ukraine. And um, at first I, I heard a rabbi talk about how this was affecting the Jewish community. And I felt like, come on, it's affecting everybody. Like, is everything about what's happening to the Jewish community? And as I began reading more and realizing that my own family is from that region, from the Ukraine and Russia and Poland. And I had never really known much about it really felt much connection. And uh, I got in touch with my cousins who had done quite a lot of work and um, began reading about it. And I couldn't sleep. I just felt like I had to be there. I just had to have my 
body there. I was almost like that Close Encounters of the Third Kind movie where everybody's just drawn to go. And um, most of the people I talked with, uh, just within days, I was I was there. I um, most of the people I was starting to say came same story, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, couldn't sleep, had to be there. And within days we were there. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I found I found two organizations that I could volunteer with. And um, I just kept watching to see when the prices dropped on airfares. And as soon as they did, I, I was there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for bringing in the ancestors too, because I think that I, I've noticed that for myself. And it's just very moving to hear you say that, that, that you felt the connection and, and in a new way with your own ancestry. And I wondered, um, I wonder if there's anything more that you'd like to say about that as you arrived there and, and spent time there. Yeah, well, uh, thank you for asking. Um, you know, I was so gung ho on my own physical body. I was happy to be feeling strong again, feeling enlivened, feeling um, just carrying less weight. And it was just like, I just thought the Shemitah year is just all about nourishing my physical body. And you know, of course, the teachings about how we're, you know, our bodies are not separate from others. And so when I began to feel that connection and not feel it, but to just understand that I wasn't giving up on my own body to go be with those who were suffering. And uh, as I was coming into Poland, <clears throat> into Warsaw on the airplane, I just felt like I really don't have words for this. I haven't really talked about it with anyone, but I just felt like I was coming into the land of my ancestors that they had been driven out of. Mm -hmm. And um, when I was in Poland, I didn't particularly feel like I was coming home in the way I did in Costa Rica, <laughs> but I, in that initial coming in and I, I had the opportunity to go to Auschwitz also mm -hmm. while I was there. So there, there was a lot of very deep connection, especially I was there during Yom HaShoah and I'm going on the trains through Poland. You know, it's like all the black and white movies we've all seen. It was, it was heavy. It was really, really very moving and um, very full. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm. Well, we have, um, yeah, El has curated some pictures, and Last we thought minute. this would be a wonderful <laughs> way to uh, have you share your trip with us. I'm but I am doing the segue here because we're starting off with a map of Ukraine, and I think really making the connection to how this, um, you know, how this touches us so deeply. Um, you know, I, I I just have been um, feeling that, so I just. Thought we'd start with that and then we'll move into hearing you um share your journey with us yeah that's how. yeah great um also if other people have questions if you want to put them in the chat as, as we're going along i'm happy to um i'm happy to respond um rabbi Irwin had sent me an email a few weeks ago saying people would love to hear what's your experience has been and i really was not at all sure what people want to hear about. So I could talk for a long time. <laughs> so it would be good to focus if there's some specific questions that people are, are interested in hearing about. I'm happy to talk about it. Great, thank you. So I'm gonna share the screen and bring up mm -hmm. uh, our slideshow. Um, so can people see, let me see. I wanna start at the beginning. Uh, there we go. Can people see that okay? Uh, if you like, you can go to the top of your screen where it says there is an option to fit to fit the screen. You have your Zoom controls. I just wanted to start with this map because this is from um, a pilgrimage that Rabbi Art Green led in, uh, I believe it was 2019 before the war began. And it was a pilgrimage to the 
uh, founders of Hasidism to honor their memory. And we have Medjibos, where the Baal Shem Tov was from, uh, his grandson, Reb Nachman of Bratslav, Levi Yitzhak of Berdichev, um, many of the great Hasidic masters. And I think um, as many of us may be discovering more deeply our own ancestry from Ukraine, Poland. Um, so, and Yael, this is Lviv and you right. were in Poland. So right, just right, yeah, right about where you have that arrow. Okay. Go down a little. Like, like right kind here. Of central, yeah, central right. west. Right. Okay, great. It was, um, so I, I landed in Warsaw and I, I spent a few days. I had to get a whole new wardrobe because we had bathing suits and shorts. And I had been seeing all these photos with people in big, heavy parkas. As it turned out, spring, spring came to Poland right around when I got there. But I spent the first few days just getting a wardrobe. And uh, we can go through these first. All, all over Warsaw were these uh, incredible outpouring of support for um, for the Ukrainians, these kind of posters, uh, and very anti-Russia and uh, very pro-Ukraine. There were Ukrainian flags all over. People had planted blue and yellow flowers. This was uh, all over the streets, uh, the hotels, the cities. Everybody had uh, these blue and yellow flowers and, and flags all over the place. Um, this was a hotel I stayed at in Warsaw for a few days, and pretty much every hotel I stayed at, about half the rooms were given free to any Ukrainians who needed uh, a place to stay. So this was uh, around an Easter festival the Ukrainians had made for their Polish hosts, and um, this was just walking down old, old town in Warsaw. There were you military presence uh, throughout. Yeah, I'm remembering something you you posted in an email about staying. The place where you stayed was a Chopin, or yeah, I'm that remembering that, that right. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, this is this. Uh, yeah, if you go back and if you want to see, yeah, right uh -huh. there. Yeah, they had concerts every night. Uh, there's a lot of Chopin. The, uh -huh. the, the airport there is named after Chopin and uh, Did you, all through. I remember you, I was very moved by this. You said that the Ukrainian refugees that were staying there would go and play music. Um, well, each night, somebody else played some uh -huh. offering from Chopin. And one night, the Ukrainians offered uh -huh. some of their own music, uh -huh. a piano concert. It was really lovely. A, a very old building, very old building. Mm -hmm. And keep going. So, yeah, At, from Warsaw, I went here. Um, this was about a, a six, seven hour train ride to the southeast. This was a school that had been converted within days uh, of the war starting. Mm. I mean, the, the outpouring of support by the Polish people is just phenomenal. There's a long history of not always friendly relations between Poland and Ukraine. And uh, a lot of people have seen this time as really an opportunity for some transformation and healing to happen. Mm -hmm. And I, I just can't even express in words the outpouring of generosity uh, of the Polish people for the Ukrainians. This was a man just a regular guy decided he was going to go make shelters for children and their mothers and grandmothers who were coming. So this was one of the places, I think I didn't include a slide of the other, but there were two main places that I worked with and I stayed here. Um, I was in a dorm room with between three and six other people on any given night. I, I ended up just being here for a couple of weeks. You want to just go through? Um, this, this is the front of the school. This, it was out in the country in, in farm farmland. I'll just do this. Oh, I, I want to ask you a yeah, question. Sure. When you say about the healing between the Poles and the Ukrainians, it also makes me think about what you said about going to Auschwitz. And, you know, I, I'm reading more about the history of Ukraine after the war and the, the tremendous, I didn't really know this. I, I thought the pogroms were more in the you know, 
hundreds, 1700s, but there's more coming out about the, you know, just tremendous violence against Jews in after World War One, And I'm wondering, as you said that, I was wondering about a healing between Poles and Ukrainians and Jews in, in the wake of the, you know, like the, this tikkun that is an opportunity in this time. Um, and I just wondered if you felt that or saw that or. Well, yeah, I had at this place, it's called Poland Welcomes. Um, I met up uh, a couple of days after I got there, a delegation of Israelis came. And again, this was started just by a, a 21 year old who had finished his military service in February and decided he just wanted uh, to go as an Israeli who lives with war, who uh, has also roots in this uh, area and felt like, you know, when people asked what were the good people doing during when war was going on. He didn't, he didn't want his children to ask that question. And he just put up a Facebook page and said he was going and he was ha he speaks Polish and Russian. Mm -hmm. And he was happy to have anybody join him and a group of about 20 people just within days uh, on their own resources came, came to Poland and um, and it went into the Ukraine as well. And I cannot tell you uh, how much the Polish and Ukrainian people appreciate the Israel mm -hmm. presence in the Ukraine and Poland. It's phenomenal. Everywhere you go, you see um, Jewish, uh, you know, Mogen David on tents, mm -hmm. they're offering free food, clothes, free phones, uh, supplies. It, it was just phenomenal. Uh, you'll see in some of these slides, mm -hmm. some of the, the people. So these were week long delegations. This was, um, you know, a recycling like we see. I, I just had included that because there's a lot of consciousness around <clears throat> ecology and conservation and uh, around water. There's big signs like in all capital letters and exclamation points. And I had no idea what any of them said. I don't speak the language, which, you know, was a little bit challenging for me to even go to a country where I don't speak the language, but I felt like I can go with an open heart and hands that work and just be there in whatever way I can. So and, I can and, kind of, you can, you know, you can kind of guess by the context what yes. that it must say, but I have no idea if I was sorting things right or not. I, I figured green was food, so I just went with that. Uh, these, these were just coats. Uh, this, this particular place, is, it's called Radomir, was the town. And uh, this housed a uh, little over 50 children and uh, almost 60 mothers and grandmothers. It was a uh, three-story. Wow. It was a, around a courtyard. I don't know if we're going to see that in these pictures, but they had so many things donated. There was water, there was food, uh, clothes, there were shoes. They could just take what, whatever they needed, sheets. I mean, everything was provided. People gave new bicycles. I mean, the kids, it was like a uh, summer camp, but, mm -hmm. you know, with if the backdrop wasn't so tragic, you mm -hmm. know, they were, you know, all the kids were running around together and it was set around a courtyard. This is baby supplies. So, um, you know, there was probably, I'd say 50 stuffed animals for every child. Oh, I mean, good. people are donating a lot of stuffed animals. If you want to donate something, they don't need any more stuffed animals, I don't think. Um, just tons of, you know, a, unbelievable outpouring of donations for these kids. Um, you know, they had all the, uh, anyway, you can just kind of go through and get an idea. There was just, there they are, like kids all over the place. They would come after us for our phones. They just wanted uh -huh. to do a video game. So, you know, we did other things with them too, but that's, that was their comfort. And, um, you know, you can, yeah, I have a question because sure. you are I've, I've seen you with children of many ages and you are incredibly attuned um, to children. And I just wonder what that was like for you when you were with these kids, what you were 
picking up what you were seeing, what you were feeling. And- yeah, thank you. It, like I say, it was in a, um, around a courtyard. So just the whole day you could just circumambulate and there were just kids, you know, a lot of runny noses, a lot of crying, and then that would pass. Mm-hmm. There wasn't a lot of extended crying, but you know, mm-hmm. uh, fleeting. And there were so many volunteers. Mm-hmm. I mean, these kids. Somebody had an issue, and you know, we were we were there. So there was this one little girl. I never saw her mother for about three days. I didn't even know who she was connected with because she kept being passed around to mm-hmm. different mm-hmm. people's arms. So mm-hmm. you know, uh, again, the Israelis were unbelievable uh, force here at Poland Welcomes Mm -hmm. and um, sorting through clothes, being with the kids. We took them bowling, took them for pizza, Mm -hmm. um, some other, a a group of Italians came through. This was unbelievable. Just these friends had rented a bus. They drove from Italy overnight, straight through, Mm -hmm. stayed overnight. They were all coughing and smoking, (laughs) but they just were ready to take uh, eight, whatever eight people wanted to move to Italy. And, um, you know, I wanted to say a lot of these um, Ukrainian people, they don't want to identify as refugees. They just feel like they're being temporarily displaced, Mm -hmm. but they're expecting to go back. And a lot of them are going back already. Mm -hmm. Uh, But a lot of them see this as an opportunity for a life that's um, better and happier than the one they were having. And uh, so they were, you know, three families were like, we're moving to Italy. And they Mm -hmm. just packed up their stuff and off they went the next morning. Mm -hmm. So You know, there's just a a steady stream of people coming through offering. There was a troop of clowns that came through from Israel and just, you know, engaging the children. Um, The children, you know, like children everywhere. They're just bright lights and wanted to eat as much candy as they could get off us and um, played Frisbee, uh, rode bicycles. you know, just loving any hugs, Mm, did a mm, lot of hugging. mm, mm. And um, like I say, there was a lot of runny noses and a lot of coughing and I got rather sick myself. Mm, mm, And mm, uh, mm. I had hoped to stay longer. I ended up staying two weeks there, but I had also signed up to go to World Central Kitchen, Mm -hmm. which I had really wanted to do. And uh, I felt that actually at that point, it was hard to stay in that place, to be mm-hmm. honest, mm-hmm. have that constant outpouring, even through the night, you know, you go to sleep hearing kids crying. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, those moms were just unbelievable uh, lion moms mm-hmm. taking care of their mm-hmm. cubs. And um, they cleaned, we cleaned all the time. This place was spotless. I think I have a picture of a little girl mm-hmm. cleaning. I don't know why I stayed on the, the kids. Hey, there's my buddies. And uh, yeah, people were knitting. Everything was blue and yellow. These were some people, this was unbelievable. These people came in with these um, kind of like Lincoln logs mm-hmm. and we just constructed them so that people could have some privacy. And, you know, they were there for weeks in these open rooms and Mm -hmm. there were so many sheets and blankets and we just kind of made these little tents. So they all had their own separate area. So every day there were projects like this. Here's a guy from New Jersey and a guy from Russia working to put these beds beds together. Mm -hmm. And- um, How was the guy from Russia? What, tell say a little bit about that. There were quite a number of Russians there, mm-hmm. particularly uh, Russians who had emigrated to Israel mm-hmm. and had come mm-hmm. with the Israeli delegation. Mm-hmm. Uh, not this guy, but um, many others. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it was a whole range of heartbreak. You mm-hmm. know, mm-hmm. many of them mm-hmm. hadn't talked with their families mm-hmm. and, um, you know, uh, many of them felt um like they weren't going to be welcomed there. They felt like that wasn't their place to be there. Mm-hmm. They felt like it was going to trigger people. And, um, but they 
felt like they wanted to be there to help mm -hmm. in in whatever way they could and Every, everybody how did people respond i mean were they welcome very welcome yeah. people were very very appreciative they just um it was a lot of hugging mm. a lot of hugging mm -hmm. with goopy noses uh -huh. uh -huh. and uh yeah i you know i there were some ukrainian people who had emigrated to israel as well and had mm -hmm. come back mm -hmm. and a lot of lot of difficulty mm -hmm. it wasn't an easy time it wasn't a smooth time but everybody was committed to be there mm -hmm. in whatever way that they could and you know people took breaks um but when i shift maybe we can just finish here mm -hmm. on the poland so yeah these are the kids a lot of art supplies we did a lot of art and drawing and mm -hmm. uh you know, the Israelis brought this this guy, Yaakov, who started Ma'alot. And, um, you know, he brought just a ton of candy from Israel. Mm -hmm. And he's just, you know, spacing it out every day. So they loved Israel. You wow. know, they just think it's <laughs> the land of chocolate candy. The land of milk and honey. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is a Polish flag and Ukrainian flag. So mm -hmm. the children mm -hmm. were always making these kind of pictures. Mm -hmm. Uh, this was the first week of the Israeli delegation. And, um, you know, they worked hard and fast. There were literally tons of clothes and mm -hmm. supplies that were donated. And we had a system where we were sorting. And, it, you know, it took a little while <laughs> to get our system down because, you know, everybody wanted to be a leader. Mm -hmm. Israelis, you know, we train our children to be leaders. So everyone had a different idea, but we finally were got it going. And I was just racing. You know, I felt like you can just plug in anywhere. And one of these women said to me, wow, you know, we could sign you up with Israeli special forces. <laughs> and, you know, I thought it was just an expression. Uh -huh. Later, someone told me she's a high up in Israel oh, special oh. forces. <laughs> so a lot of, you know, they've all had military service <laughs> and they really, you know, had it down. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know, I somehow was very short compared to everybody else, but <laughs> I held my own. I'll yeah, say that. You want to say your nickname? No, that wasn't here. That okay, was you'll tell us. <laughs> so here's some, um, uh, this, this woman came from uh, London, an Israeli who was uh, in London for work and came uh -huh. to Poland for three days, wow. was all she could be there. She, I don't think she slept the whole three days. She was with the kids all the mm -hmm. time. She's playing Frisbee with them. Just an amazing, an ama I think the next picture you see the Frisbee, but oh, mm -hmm. maybe not. This is outside in the oh, back. Yeah. So, you know, oh, the older girls, oh. they would just set up a picnic. I mean, oh. the kids were very independent. Everybody yeah. was maybe not out of choice. I mean, the mothers were just trying to, you know, cook. There was a kitchen stocked with food. Everything was free. Oh, you could, oh. they could make whatever they wanted. And then at lunchtime, uh, vans came in and brought hot food and prepared food for everybody. Oh, oh. But the children, you know, it was a very safe environment. There was really nothing, any trouble they could mm -hmm, get into. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they would just set up things like this, you know. I'm just noticing own. you're going off. So come a little closer oh, this okay. way. And if you want, you could put your feet up on this. So okay. All right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, the kids were from newborns to 19-year-olds, I'd say. 20-year-olds. That's a beautiful picture. Yeah, spring spring was coming. Oh, so here are these next couple of pictures. Finally, the short short Ukrainian women were my my buddies. This is Yaakov, the second from the left. That's who organized Ma'alot, and he's I think now this week is his sixth delegation that he's brought there. Mm -hmm. Most people are there for one or, or two weeks, mm -hmm. both at this place. Poland welcomes is the English name for it, and also at World Central Kitchen, people came in one and two week shifts for the most part. And then another one of my cleaning cleaning buddies, they they mop those floors, I don't know, Where six from? times a day, Ukraine. Is These are all Ukrainian? Ukrainians oh, who are oh. staying in the shelter. Oh, These oh. kids, um, oh. yeah, they're all mm -hmm. just unbelievable. Washing the bathroom, those toilets got washed. Everything got washed. 
except the runny nose. <laughs> really made an impression on me. Uh, so here, oh, you can't see the bottom, but you know, the kids would just pick up mops. They would, you know, do work just like everybody, you know, they weren't, nobody really seemed to need to be told what to do. Mm -hmm. People just did whatever work needed mm -hmm. to be done. Mm -hmm. And the kids all pitched in. These are the women who came at lunchtime, um, not from World Central Kitchen, but from another uh, catering place that had converted to mm -hmm. offer free meals to Ukrainians throughout Poland. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, just delicious, wholesome, basic food. Mm -hmm. And um, this was this was one day's lunch, and um, nothing super fancy. I, I got uh, two I got two helpings of potatoes because I didn't eat meat in that last one. Oh, uh -huh. so um, this is now World Central Kitchen again. I somehow got in with all these tall people. Where are these but, guys from? Uh, this uh, the guy on the right. He's from all over the place, but originally, I think, from Spain, and he did go back there. Uh, Noah, he's, he was on uh, one of those cooking chef shows that I would be more impressed if I watched. He's from oh, Georgia oh. in the United States. Um, there are a lot of people at World Central Kitchen who are chefs or mm. own their own restaurants. Wow. Mm. Also, lawyers, um, people who just wanted to be there and to help. I was starting to say before that I kind of shifted my focus of being um, right on that front line with the children and the moms, uh, especially after I got so sick. And I felt like I needed to pull back and that I could be support kind of more behind, not behind the scenes, but you know, the second, second tier. I just want to notice the time. Yes. And um, so again, people came mostly to World Central Kitchen in one week and or two week shifts. Mm. And the first week I was there was a lot of, um, yeah, there were a bunch of military, ex-military guys were there, tall ex-military guys. And we were on the sandwich making team and uh, it was very, it was, like, it was like a military maneuver, very precision, moving very, very quickly the people from all over the world, people from Zimbabwe were there, uh, people from Ireland, someone wow. was there from Greece, mm. from Japan, mm. um, there, Ukrainians were there, um, people from, oh, uh, there's my buddy Russia, everybody got, I mean, Noah, everyone got a kick out, he was six, seven. Wow. And, um, but the second week I was there, there were somehow a lot of Californians there, very competitive oh. and, uh, just really wanting to break records of how fast we could make sandwiches. Oh. I think we made almost 4,000 in an hour oh, wow. one day. Oh, wow. And uh, by the third week, I had kind of had it with the rah-rah and Noah went home. <laughs> and uh, two young Ukrainian women headed up the team. Mm. And they were very soft-spoken, but very strong. And we kept up the pace, but, you know, uh, not that fast. It mm -hmm. took us quite a bit longer, but it was very focused. This is uh, Rachel Ray came one oh, day oh, to uh, oh. work with us. There were people would come, chefs from all over the place. This between uh, Rachel and I is um, Chef Rock from San Diego. Mm. And this is his high school buddy who just said he would come along and help. Mm. They, um, they hooked up with a Polish toy making company and got, uh, I think something like $20,000 worth of toys donated mm -hmm. and uh, wanted to take them into Lviv, mm -hmm. where you showed on your map, I was gonna go with them. Mm -hmm. And um, the night before we were set to go there, they bombed right where we were gonna be. Oh my goodness. And oh. so um, I, we didn't go, but uh, actually Jim went with two, oh. Mm. two other people oh and goodness. um they had a lovely day they said in Lviv and they came back and was bombed again that mm. night so mm. not right where I was but you know within a few hours that mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. uh I was in a place where you could walk over the border I walked into yeah. Ukraine in a small village mm. and um what was that like yeah, you, it was like a small town. You wouldn't know a war was going on. Uh, when nighttime came, you could see a lot of the houses were dark. People mm -hmm. had left. Mm -hmm. And again, 
uh, the only tents that were there for those people were Israelis. Mm -hmm. And it was incredibly moving. Mm -hmm. uh, the mm -hmm. first tents coming over the border were Israelis. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had a whole shelter set up, uh, food, clothes, art supplies, mm -hmm. music. I mean, they really just young people, old mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was it was really um, you know, I, I had written to, to Rabbi Irwin and he included it, I think, in the materials that I just was so proud to be of a lineage that really put itself on the line to mm. really hold, hold that value of justice and in whatever way we could offer support. Mm. Uh, it was mm -hmm. incredibly moving. Oh, oh. Well, um, I know we have a video of oh, right. sandwich yes. making, but my suggestion <laughs> is we we take down the screen share and look at the questions in the chat and open up to discussion, and then we'll close with the how does that sound? We'll That's close great. with the, the yeah. super speedy great. sandwich yes. making. Right. Time great. lapse. Time lapse. <laughs> so here are the questions that have come in. Oh, there we missed a lot, didn't um, we? Let's see. I think the first one is from uh, Leah, um, Yael, what did you see and see of the people who are coming across the border? How are they coping? What languages were the volunteers speaking? And I know this came in kind of early, you covered some of that. Okay. I'm just gonna... Um, uh, oh, Steve else. Schwartz, oh. everyone vote for Steve Schwartz. <laughs> oh. uh, Steve says, uh, thank you for bringing up question about opportunities for tikkun between Jews and Ukrainians. My dad relayed a fear of Ukrainian authorities during the time he found himself there after April 1945. Um, yeah, the actual village where I was staying, where the World Central Kitchen has their big outposts. They, they actually have places all through Ukraine uh, um, and in Poland as well. But um, Shemesh is one of the oldest towns in Poland, and it's had a lot of strife with Ukrainians. A lot of um, over the years, there's mm -hmm. been quite a lot of um, discord there. And, um, you know, I don't know the language, uh, use Google Translate a lot and just mm -hmm. a lot of smiling and nodding and hugging. And, um, but, you know, the feeling was very open from, you know, my ignorant perspective, you know, it looked very welcoming, the big posters everywhere, welcome Ukraine flags everywhere, mm -hmm. Ukrainian mm -hmm. flags. Um, but I, I know there's a, a, of course, you know, I'm not completely naive. I know there was a lot, a lot more, a lot more there that, you know, I, I wasn't aware of. Um, Leora says, considering the occupation of Palestine, that's ironic and horrifying. I, I think maybe Leora is referring to the response to the Ukrainian refugees and how that is not being matched in Israel-Palestine. Um, Jan Schiller said, I saw a news report this morning that underground schools are being created under bombed out buildings. Mm. One teacher said that she hopes the schools will open soon. Is there a way that we could help the children in Ukraine? Thank you for sharing with us and for your compassion. Alyssa, also, thank you for sharing your wonderful heart-filled work. Um, yeah, somebody asked me about the schools and it, it hadn't occurred to me because it seemed like they were on summer vacation. But as I was leaving Poland Welcomes, there was another group coming actually from California um, who were um, transforming the attic at the school into a childcare center mm -hmm. and to have the art room that we'd had below, they were gonna turn into a classroom. So. You know, this had just been going on a few weeks or a month. Um, people were just trying to respond to immediate needs of having people be safe and meeting their physical needs. And, um, and I, but I know there was a lot of effort around um, having, having schools continue. A lot of these people weren't really resigned to be there for a long time. And in fact, somebody had asked about the border. So, I saw people coming and then going back. People were going up and back 
lot of people were taking a lot of the donated clothes back and selling them in the Ukraine. Um, the, the men couldn't leave the Ukraine. They had to stay there to, to fight. So we would sort the clothes and just put all the anything for men aside, but they could come up to the border. So there was somebody in, in the Israeli group who had, had, had managed to connect with a lot of the fathers from the Ukraine who were bringing dogs and cats for the children wow. who were missing wow. their pets. Wow. Oh, and he would meet them at the border wow. and come through. And, and again, there was a whole setup. There were veterinarians, there were uh, carriers for the animals, um, the free phones they were giving to people mm-hmm. and um, just trying to, support the families in in every way that they could um you know people some people had asked what they could donate and uh, you know we were saying it's enough with the stuffed animals but they could really use uh rolling luggage that uh-huh. was like at a premium because uh-huh. they were just carrying what they could carry yes. people had some people you know had been coming for 14 16 hours it it took them uh, there were on the polish side it took sometimes up to 40 hours to get through for the cars carrying humanitarian aid because there were so many of them. People, there were truck filled with cars because there was no taxes. Mm. So they were all just coming through and coming the other way. They said sometimes it was four days for them Mm. to to be able to get through because so many people were wanting to to come. Mm. But Mm -hmm. during the time I was there, people were just walking, walking through the border mm-hmm. it's at Medica was mm-hmm. where I was next to Shemesh. And um, yeah, they were tired they were hungry. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, those mothers were just warriors for their children mm-hmm. to, mm-hmm. to bring mm-hmm. them in. Mm-hmm. Um, there was a, a heartbreaking story. I don't know how our time is. I think, I we think have, we're done. Uh, yes. Any, just, um, I have more heartbreaking stories, but um Hmm. So do, would you like to share the um yeah you could video? see the one i just i just tell this yes. one because it's yes, incredibly please. moving yes. uh, uh world central kitchen in addition to having this big kitchen that um makes food they're at the train stations in these um little um booths and um meeting meeting the trains that are coming in from the ukraine and this one woman came, I wasn't there, a friend of mine from World Central Kitchen was telling us, uh, this woman was just crying hysterically at needing help. She couldn't understand what she was saying, but she knew she needed help. She was calling people to come. She had a big suitcase. Uh, it turned out she was so afraid her young child was gonna be crushed by the crowd that she put him in the suitcase. And she just wanted to make sure he was okay, which he was. But just to give you a sense of the desperation that these, you know, people just want to get across in whatever way they can to get to a safe place. So it it was just an incredibly moving um, experience to see the strength of people in the midst of this incredibly horrific war. Mm, mm, mm. Thank you, Yael. Thanks, thank Shoshana. you for sharing with us and thank you for following your heart to go and be of service. And, and just um, every day that you were there, I just I just felt so grateful to you for being there. Um, um, and I hope you will, I know it feels like there's so much to um, integrate and I uh, just hope that uh, you keep doing that. I hope you do some writing about it and keep sharing. It's just incredible to hear. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So, Shall we? Yeah, this was uh, this uh, video was made by the second week group who was uh, just ferocious in how fast they could make sandwiches. This, this is, is obviously a time lapse. It's a little bit faster, but it's not that much faster. <laughs> it's, this it's pretty close to this. Okay, let's see. Can yeah. everybody see this? Yeah, okay. that's it. There we let's go. See. Oh, I don't know if people are seeing this. No? Okay. Yes, we're, yes, we're oh, seeing God. it. Okay, yeah, great. there we are making our salami and cheese sandwiches. It was not a kosher environment. Uh.
Thank you. Mm. Mm. Thank you, Yael. Thank you, Shoshana. Thank you. Um, there are more thanks pouring into the chat that you should be sure to take a look at. Mm. <clears throat> we we're glad to have you back and we were glad to have you there. Thank you. Um, we in uh, about, um, we could take a little break, but uh, let's regather in about five minutes because uh, Barbara has some thank yous and announcements, and then we'll begin our closing meditation. Um, thank you all for being here. Don't go far. Be back in five. Yeah, Ellen Shoshana, it's lovely to see you talking and trying to sense what it is that you're sharing. The <laughs> smiles are so wonderful. Oh, oh thank you. Barbara. Thank you so, so much. What an amazing, amazing time you had. And it felt as if a little piece of us was there with you. Definitely. And that, you know, that made all the difference for us in terms of or longing to be of service. So thank you so much. We not unmute now. We're unmuted. We're unmuted. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I really I felt. I, I just want to say I, I really felt that uh, so many people were there with me and supporting my efforts. And uh, I know if circumstances were otherwise. Uh, people would be there and so many um, limitations on our time and our resources. And uh, I was happy I could be there for the others as well. Yeah. It's, it, it's important to have the mix of the, the spiritual connection. And I think Reb Irwin did an amazing job in his droshes. Um, of trying to help us really cope with our historical perspective with that region, how many of us have roots in the Ukraine, how things have changed over time. And we had two really wonderful teachings 
um, one by a colleague in the history department at Sonoma State who talked a little bit of the historical context. And then um, Ed Marx, who's the father of Allison Marx, who's on our board, uh, talking about the work that he'd been doing over time in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And then to have you then share with us the on the ground experience is so meaningful. Oh, good. And yeah. um, so huge gratitude. Well, thank you, Rabbi Irwin, for inviting me to, to share this. I was really honored. Um, it was wonderful to have you and really important for us to, to hear and feel connected um, to what's going on. Sort of in the same way we were talking before about hearing things going on and not knowing how to connect in is really important for us. Um, I'm sorry to schedule you so late. We scheduled no, you. Okay. It would be morning, morning in Poland. I know my my plans changed and um, here I am. Well, thank you for staying up late for us. <laughs> um, so Barbara, oh, so let me turn off the recording.